While we were going through the Sermon on the Mount this past uh, year or so, we came across the Lord's Prayer. Remember in, in Matthew chapter 18? And he's teaching his disciples up on that mountainside how to pray. And as he taught them how to pray, this phrase came up in that prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy what? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if there's anything that God wants us to know and understand, it's his will. So when I know his will, then I can be accountable and obey it. But I need to know his will. And sometimes I don't know his will. Some young people, are they, they date somebody and they say, Lord, I don't know. Is this the one for me or not? And many times uh, the Lord uh, nudges you through your parents and through the word and through friends, the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. But it's not like he writes it in the sky. She's the one. But you begin to discover it with him, with the Lord, and with your parents. Sometimes it's, uh, do we move? Uh, like the written hours to, to Texas, you know, to be with family and friends. And, and especially while he's been going through the chemotherapy and that kind of stuff. And you say, Lord, what's your will? And he says, oh, okay, I, I want you to know my will for your life. And this morning, I'd like to look at one area of his will for our lives. That sometimes we kind of overlook. We think, oh, I married the, the right person, and I'm, I'm working at the right job, and, and I'm taking care of my kids, and, and so I, there's nothing else that's going on. But I want you to look at, at this verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, where he clearly is going to spell out for you God's will, at least in one area of your life. And here's what he says. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people. How? By doing good. So here he's just, you know, instead of us having to say, Lord, is this your will for my life? Lord, is she the one? Lord, is he the one? Lord, is this the job? Lord, is this where I move? This is just a specific area where the Lord just comes right out and says, here's my will for your life. God desires that in our nation, we silence the ignorance of foolish people. How? By doing good. By serving him. And if we pray for our leaders and those in authority, he says, so that you might live a quiet and what? Peaceable life. A quiet and peaceable life. And that goes right up to here, that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. He goes on, as God's slaves live as free people, but don't use your freedom as a way to conceal evil. So it's God's will that we do good, and the very next thing he hooks into is if you're going to do good, you're going to be called God's what? God's slave. Now, the Greek word for this is doulos. You've seen this perhaps many times. As a matter of fact, Operation Mobilization used to have one of their ships called doulos. And it would travel from country to country and distribute li literature. And it was just a wonderful thing. Doulos. Hey, hey, and here's what most people think. Oh, that's a servant. And they almost think of a waiter. You know, you're there as the waiter and you're waiting on other people. You're this servant who's willing to help them. But if I could just clearly give you the New Testament meaning of this Greek word, it looks more like this. And instead of a server puts the chains on. He says, I'm a slave of Christ. Whatever he wants for me, wherever he wants me to go, whatever he wants me to do. And if I'm going to do good, the verse in 1 Peter said, as Christ's, what? Slaves. He's asking you to say, okay, Lord, here I am. Take me anywhere you want. Do anything you want with me. I'm going to be a slave. Now, the difference between, and the reason most people don't want to be called slaves is because that all the negative influence that America had regarding slavery years ago. 
And if you've ever um, read the story of uh, William Wilberforce, it's a wonderful um, life story and how he stood up in England against slavery. Because that kind of slavery wasn't voluntary. It was forced on people. You were buying people and selling them. But this kind of slavery is where you willingly say, Lord, Lord, you're the master. Lord, if you're the Lord, I'm the servant. Lord, if, you, if you're the master, I'm the, I'm the slave. And are you willing to reach that point where you say, Lord, I want to be a slave of yours? Look at it in the Old Testament What's interesting, and I use the word that's used in the Old Testament here many times as servant because slavery wasn't really rampant in the Old Testament until they started taking over different countries. And then they would take all the people captive and then they start selling them as slaves and now they could have more money and help pay for the war and those kind of things. But at first, look at Abraham, his servant, he was a servant of the Lord. Psalm 105, verse 6. Moses, his servant. Psalm 105, verse 26. David, the servant of the Lord. And, you know, that's in Psalm 18 in the prefix. You know, in the postscript, in the, in the prescript to the, this whole psalm. It's not in verse 1 unless you include that prescript to Psalm 1. And we did that many times as we went through uh, the entire psalms. That first part is there. And who put it there? God put it there, and it's just inspired as the rest of the word, except uh, it's a kind of a background on it. And so the background on Psalm 18 is David is a servant of the Lord. But by the time you get to the New Testament, what's the translation? Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, Romans 1.1. James, a slave of God, James 1.1. Epaphras, a fellow slave, Colossians 1.7. Tychicus, a servant of the Lord. And the reason I put that in here is because the Greek word is diakonos there and not doulos. Because there's a difference between a servant and one who sees himself as a slave. We're all willing to serve one another, but are we slaves of Jesus Christ? Can he dictate to us what we're supposed to do? He goes on, Simon Peter, a slave of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. If God were still writing scripture today, would he be able to put your name down as a slave of the Lord? You know, he's writing scripture back then, and it was Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, Simon, a slave of Jesus Christ. Is it your name, a slave of, of Jesus Christ? Let me say it this way. God calls every follower of Christ to a life of active servanthood, or can I use even slave? He wants us to be his servants. Serving him for our own spiritual growth and, and the building of his kingdom. I don't know if you heard about this. Uh, Winston-Salem has a, had a mega church. They put this out on the internet and sent letters out. They uh, sent letters out to tell freeloading members to get lost. Let me read you what, was, what went out. North Carolina. Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Julie and Bob Clark were stunned to receive a letter from their church in July asking them to participate in the life of the church or worship elsewhere. They basically called us freeloaders, said, says Julie. We were freeloaders, says Bob, in a trend that may signal rough times for wallflower Christians, bellwether megachurch faith community of Winston-Salem has asked non-participating members to stop attending. No more Mr. Nice Guy, says the executive pastor, newly hired from Singular Wireless. Bigger is not always better. Providing free services def indefinitely to complacent Christians is not our mission. Freeloading Christians were straining our church's nursery and facility resources, in addition to harming the church's ability to reach the lost, says the pastor. When your bottom line is saving souls, you need to weed out some of the people who interfere with that goal, he said. If you got this kind of letter, what would you say? Faith community, 
Interesting, <laughs> same name. Faith community sent polite but firm letters to families who attend church services and freebie events, but never volunteer, never tithe, and do not belong to a small group or other ministry. The church estimates that of its 8,000 regular attendees, only half have volunteered in the past three years, then a third have never given to the church. Before now, we made people feel comfortable and welcome and tried to coax them to give a little something in return, says the staff member. That's changed. We're, being, we're, we're done being the community nanny. Surprisingly, the move to disinvite people has drawn, has drawn positive response from men in the community who like the idea of an in-your-face church. I thought, finally, a church that doesn't allow the uncommitted. That rocks, says Bob Clark. He admires a church, the church more since they told him to get lost. He and Julie are now tithing and volunteering. We're taking our place in the church life, he says. You know, I'm just wondering if I receive that kind of letter, or if you receive that kind of letter, if... The Holy Spirit would just speak to your heart and say, what are you doing? Where are you serving? Are you one of the people that would have gotten that letter and said, hmm, they're asking me to get lost. You know, there are three reasons every, no, there are more than three, but I'm going to give you three reasons that every Christian should be serving in the Lord's church. First one is, Christ created us to serve him. Can you imagine? I mean, he said, I'm going to create, they see you, to do this. And I'm going to create Tim McClure to do this. And I'm going to create J.J. Shram to do this. And I'm going to create, and he goes right down through the list. And he's created you to have a relationship with him and to serve him. Now, we all like and appreciate Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you say through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10 says it this way, for we are his creation. So let's get to the bottom line here. First, you have to come to the point where you recognize God created you and he created you for a purpose. It wasn't just so you could lay back and take life easy and just enjoy everybody. He created you so that you could know and enjoy him forever. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him how long? Forever. But he said, I want you to serve me. I'm going to create you to serve me. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. Not so we can just sit around and, you know, we like the verse uh, in John. You, you may have life and have it more abundantly. So God has come so you can have abundant life. And that means sitting back and just taking it easy. You know what our church uh, does? Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of people that from time to time come to us from other churches. Many times if, there, if there's been a problem, we'll say, is there, is there an issue? And we've even talked to them about going back and working things out. You know, this, this past year, even, you know, there was one situation where a family was disciplined from another church. They came to our church. We, worked, we called the other church up, and in the whole course of events, there was restoration. It was just a week ago that I sat with that person and said, you know, can I encourage you to even go back and visit now this former church? Let's get some things established. Let's work some things out. Why? Because if you just leave a church because of problems, you're just going to take the same problems to the next church. And if you try to work them out and the other church doesn't work with you, see us. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk to the pastors and we'll, we'll work with you on that. But in this case, he said, you've, create, you've been created for good works and God wants you to serve and to do something. You are saved to serve, not to sit. This is Mary Lynn Mueller. Mary Lynn uh, and Walter were a part of uh, our church um, 
and our church is kind of convoluted. And, and when did it start? We had a couple of starts because we had West Valley Church that started in 1987 and Faith Community Church that was already here started in 1964. Can you believe the 50th anniversary of this church is coming up next year? And in the meantime, what happened is they were without a pastor and we were without a building, and so we married each other. And it just became a, a wonderful thing to just watch. And Mary Lynn, though, was a part of West Valley Church right from the start. So when we were addressing letters, all 24,000 letters, Mary Lynn was helping out with that process. Now, some of the process, you know, because you say, I can hear some of you say, well, I'm too old to really serve. Yeah, what can I do? You know what she did? She would get little kids in her neighborhood. And she'd even have the little kids sit there with her. And she'd talk to them about Jesus, and they would address the envelopes. Believe me. You know, when I first looked at the envelope, I go, oh my goodness, what happened here? You know, because little kids were writing and printing on there. But you know something? God took an old person, and he took the little kids. And no matter what age they were, they were able to do something for God. And you know something? The people who got those letters said, wow, who wrote this one? You know, they opened it. It wasn't like to the household of, you know, and, and just peel them off and put them on. What do you do when you get that kind of stuff? You look at it and you say, okay, this isn't for me. But when you get a little kid's handwriting, what do you do? I mean, you don't even know who it's from. And so people opened it up and they came and she was responsible for that kind of thing. Now, Mary Lynn and Walter, Walter he became one of our elders at one point. And he was a wonderful guy. Everybody loved Walter. Walter went to be with the Lord. When Walter went to be with the Lord, we had his funeral on Sunday morning. People came to church and didn't know they were coming to a funeral service. We had visitors that Sunday. Mark and Diane, the McNets were visiting that very first Sunday. So they came in, and here's the casket down front. And we, we had two services at that time in the old, other building. And it was, and I said to Walter, Walter, you know, unless God intervenes, you're going to see Jesus before I do. Because he had prostate cancer and it was just getting at him. And I said, so I was thinking, our people, I said, you know, we're still a relatively new church. And people don't know. What happens to people when they die? And when we, since we preach series and through books and stuff like that, you know, the Bible, sometimes you don't get to the death of a believer. And I said, so if you would like, talk it over with Mary Land, and maybe we'll have your service here that Sunday, that Sunday morning. He never let me know. But he told his neighbor. He said, hey, when I die, you know what they're going to do? <laughs> and so the neighbor came over and said to Mary Lynn, you know what Walter said to me? That they're going to have the service at the church on that Sunday. What time is it going to be? She said, I didn't know anything about it. So she found out and I found out through his neighbor. And then we had a service. They were just wonderful people. But you know what Walter would do? Walter was a handyman. He could do almost anything. Kind of like Kurt Redeker. Because God's designed us for a purpose. Let's use that purpose somewhere for God's glory. And it might be addressing envelopes like Mary Lynn did. Or it might be Walter helping out around the church. But Walter, he would do what some men do. You know when you need a screwdriver and you don't have a screwdriver? Where do you go when you need a screwdriver? The kitchen, somebody said. And so you use one of the kitchen knives. What are you slapping him for? <laughs> Nick! Nick! Aren't you glad that I see that, Lily? That's good. Okay. She just gave him a... <laughs> here. I love you, Nick. Here. Here we go. <laughs> That's good. Well, you're just like Walter then. And Walter would take one of the kitchen knives... And what he would do is, you know, he would say, I need to get in that door. I need to get someplace, you know. And then it was like this. Let's just come across like that and pick it open. And Mary Lynn would say to him, don't do that. That's not the purpose of that knife. You know, whether it's a butter knife or a cutting edge knife, don't do that. That's not what that knife was made for. Would Walter listen? 
No, no, you know, men. <laughs> so one day he came to dinner. And when he sat down, this is what he saw. <laughs> His screwdriver was stuck in the butter dish. <laughs> and he says, okay, I get the point. I get the point. God has made us for a purpose. And the problem is, especially in churches, when we don't have enough people that have laid down their life as slaves of Christ, then we put people who aren't equipped and aren't trained and aren't gifted in the wrong positions. And then they get frustrated in those positions because they're doing something they weren't gifted to do and somebody else is sitting back doing nothing. And as we begin this school year, this September, this is your opportunity to say, God, where do you want me to serve? What do you want me to do? You were saved to serve, not to sit. And in the process, you have to say, God, what, what have you gifted me to do? You created me for this. This is why you created me. We are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. God has prepared opportunities here at Faith just for you. But if you don't use those opportunities, you know, I remember, and maybe Tim, you remember this too, that when the elder board met years ago and we were in the building next door, and we didn't even have a Sunday school. And the elders voted to have a Sunday school. And at the time, I, I, was, I was voting against it. I, and we had two little kids. And I said, you know, I remember as a kid going to Sunday school classes and being bored out of my mind. Why? Because there were times that they were just sticking somebody in there. Not somebody with a gift of teaching. Not somebody that maybe loved the kids. So I said to the elders, you know, I'm not sure my, I'm not sure my son or daughter are going to attend Sunday school. I said, they're going to be in worship because that's certainly where... God brings the body of Christ together. And then I gave my kids the opportunity to choose Awana or Sunday school. And I said to them, you know, just because your dad's the pastor doesn't mean that he has to, that you have to be every, at the church every time the doors are open. I wanted my kids to be like other kids. They had opportunities to grow in the Lord, but not to impose this pastoral role or this, and we never even allowed people to call our kids PKs. Because we didn't want to brand them with something, you know, what do I, what do I call your kids? You know? I wanted, I wanted them to be kids like your kids. I wanted them to grow up in a godly home and, and learn about the Lord. So our kids did this. They came to worship with us. They came to the Iwana program. At first, they didn't come to Sunday school. The first time my son went to Sunday school, he sat in the class in the building next door. And the teacher didn't even know the books of the Bible. And the kids in the, la in the class started to make fun of the teacher. And that teacher came to me after that, in between the services. Because, you know, now the, the pastor's son was in there when all this went on. You know, and what happens? Look, that's an area where you need to know a little more to be able to serve the Lord. But you, you know that, you remember that uh, TV program called Family Feud? I hardly ever watch it, but, and I don't know if it's still on, but it, it's something like this. Uh, it's set up, and the question is going to be this, and I'm just going to give you some answers here. But the question is this, why don't Christians serve at faith? What, what is the reason they don't serve? Now, I had it set up for a full-blown thing so that you were going to shout out an answer and stuff like that. I'm not going to take the time to do that. Let me give you this and say that some, one of the top reasons people say they don't serve at faith is they're too old. Okay? I'm too old to serve. How, what can I do? You know, I mean, I got aches and pains that I can't get out. And, you know, I mean, I've served for years. Somebody else's turn. And, and you know, uh, in this service, our young people don't get up, you know, early like, you know, the, our older people. 
And so where does that put this, the people in this service? <laughs> you know, they're, they're the ones that are saying, hey, I'm getting old. Now, I understand there are problems with age. I, you know, at 65, I understand that. But that doesn't mean that you can say, I'm not going to serve anymore. I'll give you some examples in a second on that. But this is one of the excuses. I, I'm told to serve. Or there's another one. I, I don't know where to serve. Yep, it's there. I, I'm going to get 100 on this, you know. Uh, I don't know where to serve. You know, I, I, I don't, uh, what can I do? Like Mary Lind. She addressed letters. She got kids in. You know what they did? They would bring kids from their neighborhood to the Iwana ministry. And they'd serve in the Iwana ministry. And they'd serve in Vacation Bible School. And they'd have a five-day club at their house in the summer times. Why? She, all she had to do was invite the neighborhood kids. And then we sent the interns and they did the work. Can't you do something like that, no matter how old you are? But I don't know where to serve. If you don't know where to serve, then in our bulletin today, in our bulletin today there's a number of areas listed there. In addition to that, Brad and Norman's main job is to find you jobs. He's the director of assimilation and discipleship. And you say, I'm not serving anywhere. And he says, well, what's your gift? Well, I think it's singing. And he says, let me hear you. <laughs> no, they, he doesn't say that. <laughs> you guys. He's just going to say, you know, there are people that think they have some gifts, and we really need to try that and see if they have those gifts. But these are some of the ministries. And so some people, uh, I, I don't know where to serve. Uh, there's another one. Another reason people don't serve is they say, I don't know enough of the Bible. You know, I, you know something? You don't have to hardly know anything about the Bible to serve in the nursery. You might have to know how to change a diaper. <laughs> or how about helping in the good news clubs, the, fi the, the good news clubs in the school system? You know something? They require us to have two adults taking a child to the bathroom. Now, the last time I checked, it didn't take any Bible verses to walk somebody to the bathroom. But when we have two people that need to walk people to the bathroom, that means that we can't have a club if we don't have enough workers. Or one person is in there with 50 kids. Do you need to know where to serve? There are so many areas to serve. At the House of Hope, you may just go over and sit with some kid because he doesn't have any grandpa or grandma. They passed away. They had drug problems. And they'll sit there and enjoy the fact that you're loving on them. And they'll be... When we moved out here, my parents were in New York. Audrey's parents were in Illinois. So Don Northrup, Don and Jenny Northrup became kind of grandparents to our kids. And when they'd come on Sunday... Don would do, you know, what some of you do to your grandkids or something. He'd maybe have a piece of candy or a quarter, and he'd give them something just to encourage their hearts. He'd always talk to them. They'd always do special things for them. Let me give you another one. Sometimes they say, and this is probably the one that most people say, I'm too busy. Where am I going to I don't have time to serve. You know something? If God's created you to serve, and you don't have time to serve, then you're too busy. Now, if it's already serving the Lord, and you're already busy serving the Lord, that's great. That's what he's designed you to do. Serve the Lord. But if you're working so many jobs, then I want to challenge you to cry out to God to give us this day our daily bread in a job that you can do and have time to serve him. Because if you don't have time to serve him, you're going to answer to God in eternity. And we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things done in the body, whether good or bad. He's just giving us opportunities to serve. The last one 
is one that some people try to use here from time to time. Then they go, oh, rats, it doesn't work. They say, oh, but I'm not a member at faith. And you know something? You don't have to be a member to serve here. But you do have to sign our doctrinal statement that says, okay, yes, I agree with that. And these, this is what you practice. This is what you believe. Because obviously we don't want you teaching something that doesn't agree with Scripture. So if we had these five things, maybe this is why people don't serve. But let me take this, this old age one for a second, okay? This is Ralph Reese with Jacob Beach. This was in 2003. Jacob is now 16. He hangs around their church, and you'll see him, you know, but you see the little guy on the right is Jacob. Do you know Jacob? Yeah. So he's up here now, you know, and he's, he's growing in the Lord and serving the Lord. This is Ralph. Into his 80s, he was serving in the Iwana program. Why? And my dad did it into the 80s. My mom was doing it. Did they ever, did they ever uh, do, do something that we wouldn't do? Yeah, I remember my parents would serve in the Iwana store. And they got confused about the, the missions uh, offering. We let our kids, you know, at Faith, we, at that time, I don't know if they do it now or not, but at that time, we had this missions bucket. And the kids could give their one dollar dollar buck or, or their $5 or $10. And at the time, we would match, you know, what they put in. My mom or dad were working in, in the Iwana store, and they were taking the kids buy money, and then my folks would go and stick it over in the missions thing. <laughs> and I go, I, I mean, I had no idea that what they were doing. You know, they thought that's where well, they saw money there, so that must be where it goes. But just more money went to missions. You know? And it was the only money those kids had. What we're saying is it's time to serve God. It's time to be one of the committed people. It's time to do what he's designed you to do. Here's Ralph doing it. Here's another shot of Ralph uh, with me, 2003, at the park, down here for the picnic. Remember, you know, when we had the picnic down here? This was Ralph down there. What you don't see in this picture is this. Let me back this out and let you see the rest of the picture. Ralph is in a wheelchair. Because Ralph couldn't walk. Because when Ralph had surgery, and one of the problems with his heart, they said, if this isn't successful, you'll be paralyzed. Pastor Char Charlie Miller had the same surgery at Desert Highlands. He was fortunate in that he wasn't paralyzed. Ralph became paralyzed. When they got home that night from the hospital, or after, when they took him out, and came time to go home. He's in the wheelchair, and he and Flora Bell, they couldn't even get into their bedroom because they had a little small home, and as the wheelchair went down the hallway, it couldn't turn and navigate. The doors weren't big enough for him to get through. I would have sat there and cried and said, what else can go wrong? They sat there and laughed. What a godly example. Your kids, you want your kids around those kind of people. But not only, you know, Ralph couldn't walk, but then he got macular degeneration. So he'd come to our board meetings, because he was on our elder board, and he couldn't see straight ahead to read the minutes. Got so into see out of the sides. You think you're too old to serve? Let me give you another example of an old guy. Oh, who is that? Oh, I'm sorry, Ian. I didn't realize you'd be here. <laughs> Ian, uh, how long have you served in the Iwana program? 48 years. That's, as all, that's almost as old as me. <laughs> you know, and look at he's training some 
crazy guy in the background, too, how to do it. You know, he came to me and he said, hey, I, I've done the Iwana program for a few years. I was the Iwana commander here before that. He said, I don't know if you would be willing to give it up. He said, but I'd be willing to do it. I said, you say the word, Ian, and it's yours. Because what do we want to do? You know, as elders and as leaders, we don't want to do, we don't want to take the jobs away from you. We want you to have the joy of serving. There used to be a great hymn, there is joy in serving Jesus, joy that throbs within my heart. You know, the joy of serving Jesus is what we would really want you to have. But if you're going to serve the Lord, oh my, here's Ian on the dunk tank right outside this wall at Fairmont Fair. Did you go in the dunk tank last year, Ian? No, praise the Lord. This, <laughs> he, he finally graduated from that. But here he is in the dunk tank. They throw the ball at an arm hanging out. If you're going to serve, sometimes it ends up like this. And Ian, how old are you today? 77? So this would have been when you were 68, 69, 70. But you're too old to serve? Look, let me give you some reasons why every Christian should serve the Lord. One, Christ created us to serve. Ephesians. He's designed you and created you, and he said, I want you to serve. Secondly, Christ redeemed us to do good works. Well, there are a lot of verses here, but let me give you some. Colossians 1, verses 9 and 10. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of what? Can you say it? The knowledge of his will. What did we start out this sermon about? The Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What did Peter say about this? He said, I want you to know God's will, and God's will is that you do good works and that you silence the ignorance of foolish men. As God's slaves, you do this. Now he's saying, you can know the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Let me slide it up. Why do you need to know his will? So that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. He said, I want you to do this. Why did I save you? So that you could do this. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, he says it this way. For they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you, how you turned to God from idols. You used to worship idols, but you got saved. And when you turned to God from idols, what was the purpose of all of that? To serve the living and true God. So the question is, what are you doing to serve? You were saved to serve, not saved to sit. Titus 2.14 says it this way. He gave himself for us. Christ gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse us for himself. A people for his own possession. Eager to do what? Good works. This is why so many people get confused about salvation. They think that they have to work their way to heaven. This isn't about working your way to heaven. You were saved, you were redeemed, and he redeemed you so that you would do good works. We don't work be to get saved, we work because we're saved. But the question I have for you is the Holy Spirit really walked over your life and said, what are you doing? Where are you serving in my body? Hebrews 9.14, the, the one time I, I remember learning something in Sunday school was I learned Hebrews 9.12. I memorized it that Sunday morning on the way to church, and it was so convoluted that I've never forgotten it. And it says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. King James Version, by the way, you know. Hebrews 9, 12, because he's saying it wasn't by the blood of goats and calves that our sins have been forgiven, but by his own blood. And he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That's verse 12. By the time you get to verse 14, he says, how much more will the blood of the Messiah, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciences from dead works to do what? To serve the living God. It was his death on the cross that said, I want to enable you to serve me. I mean, let's face it. Do you think God needs you to serve him? He doesn't need us to serve him. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our time. He's doing this for you so that you can be a co-laborer with him. That's hard to imagine that he's going to let us be co-laborers with him. Let me give you another reason. We're created to serve him. Secondly, we were redeemed. He redeemed us for these good works. Thirdly, Christ gifted us to serve him. He said, I want you to have these gifts. When you got saved, you were given a gift. A spiritual gift to use for his glory. You know, I was talking <clears throat> to a guy <clears throat> within the last month who theologically believes that none of the gifts are active today. Absolutely none of them. He said, oh, it's just consistent. If you believe that you know, the tongues have ceased or this is, miracles have ceased and all these have ceased, he said, and they were given to the apostles so that everything else has ceased. I said, how does Christ accomplish the work in his church then? If he doesn't, do we do it in our own strength or in the gifts he's given us? Here's what it says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And by the way, in this passage, he goes through some of the gifts in this passage. He said, a demonstration of the Spirit is given to each person to produce what is beneficial. What is beneficial is to the body. Not for me. The gift that I have or others have in teaching is not for us. It's not like we in, in, enjoy saying, okay, I have nothing to do with my time. I'd like to sit around for about 20 hours this week and, and put together this sermon. We want to do it because this is going to be beneficial for the body. We proclaim the word because it's beneficial to others. Your gift is beneficial for others. It's not about what, oh, you felt so good when I did this. You're doing it for somebody else. When your little child was born and it needed change, did you say, ah, I'm going to change this for my benefit? Yeah, it may have been. This really smells. <laughs> I'm going to change it. But it's for its benefit. You say, I'm going to feed it for its benefit. It, when it throws up down the hallway on the way to the bathroom, because you, you clean it up, because it's a benefit to the others in the house, as well as you. Let me give you another verse. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. He, Christ, personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of the ministry. To do what? To build up the body of Christ. Well, the last time I checked, the body of Christ is right here. It still exists. And he's given you a gift to build up this body of Christ. Are you using that gift for his glory? Or are you someone that's coming and just sitting on Sundays? Let me give you this one. Romans 12, verses 9 and 10. Show family affection to one another with brotherly love. Outdo one another in showing honor. I love that, I love that translation that way. Outdo one another in showing honor. You know, we know how to outdo each other. Hey, let's play a game of basketball. I want to outdo you. Let's do this and let's outdo you. And let's do this. And we try to outdo people for things. Have you ever tried to outdo people in showing them more honor? That, that would be amazing. Just, oh, I want to honor you and I want to, and just begin to glorify God by doing that. Hands do not lack uh, diligence. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. It's just serving the Lord. This comes right after Paul has listed some spiritual gifts. And what's the purpose of the spiritual gifts that he lists earlier in the text? So that you would serve the Lord, so that you do something for God. What's wrong with this picture? Look at this picture. What's wrong with it? <laughs> the wrong wheels are on the cart. You got the square wheels on the cart and the round wheels in the cart. That's what happens in churches when you have the gift of being the round wheel and say, 
Now, I'm not, I, I, I'm too busy for this. I'm too old for this. I don't know enough Bible for this. I'm not a member here. Whatever the reason you are giving, it's n- not really good enough. I'm just going to say, uh, Bach was given a gift from God. We'll talk more about him in, maybe in the weeks ahead. Uh, but for now, his gift, he started the, as the organist at 17 years of age at his church. They then made him in charge of the whole music ministry there. As a music minister, you know what he did? Every single month in his ministry there, he wrote a brand new cantata every month and performed it with the choir and the orchestra at his church. Every single month. Is it any wonder that you have the Hallelujah Chorus and things like that that come out of that era? Because they were it wasn't like uh, God didn't say, "Here, I'm going to." God gave him a gift, and He did use it for His glory. And I'm not saying, "Okay, you have to play an instrument, you have to do this." I'm saying, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. Better is one day in the courts, in your courts, than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God, uh, of my God, than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Can I put that in the modern translation? I'd rather be a greeter at Faith Community Church in the back, handing out the bulletins than dwelling in the tents of the wicked. I want to do something for God. That's what I want you to do. Do something for God. Because someday we almost stand, we almost appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So here's our challenge to you today. Find one area of ministry that you would be willing to commit to serving God at faith this year. It, I don't have any other way to say it. It's, it's an area of obedience. What did First Peter say? First Peter 2, 15 and 16. This is God's will, that you do good. As his slaves, that you're there serving as his slaves. Steve Jobs, this is John Scully with him. Steve Jobs in 1983 tried to recruit John Scully. John Scully was um, one of the high up guys at Pepsi-Cola or one of the other pop companies, one of the cola companies. Steve Jobs finally said to him this statement, you can stay and sell sugar water or you can come with me and change the world. He went with Steve Jobs and the rest is kind of history with your iPhones and your iPads and your IMAX and your everything else. But he just laid down, do you want to sell sugar water or do you want to change the world? I want to say to you, do you want to be busy in everything else or do you want to change this community and change this world for Christ? You can sit there or you can come and join us and help us change the world for Christ and be obedient at the same time to his command. Joshua said it this way to his people, choose for yourselves today the one you will worship. As for me and my family, we will worship Yahweh. We will worship the Lord. Verse 18 of that same chapter, they responded, we too will worship the Lord because he is our God. Who are you going to choose? Who are you going to serve? Remember this story? You know something? That church doesn't even exist. It was sent out on the internet as a spoof. So people would be challenged. So that you would be challenged. But the real issue is, if letters were sent out like that today, would you be one of the people that's not serving his body? The question I have for you today is this. How are you serving Christ and his church at faith?